There we go. Okay. So our uh, final presentation before lunch is by Chantal, and she's going to be talking about, I think, integrating data pool methods into the next generation stock assessment model, which I completely agree on, and so does Andre too. So I'm looking forward to this. True, that would be challenging. Okay. Well, it's a little off the slide, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, what did I do? Oops. Sorry, Kay. It's okay. Yeah, it's not going live. That's okay. No, no worries. Um, so, data limited methods are pretty numerous and can be overwhelming given the number of different methods that you have available at your fingertips. Different methods will do different things with different data sources and they'll generate you, oh, thank you, um, different outputs. And so how you interpret all these different applications, the values get out, can be a bit overwhelming because these methods have been designed to be simple and so much of the assumptions are hidden from the user. So you're just putting in a simple data type, getting one answer out, and you're kind of left with the question of how appropriate is that answer given your situation. So in the data limit context, we really want to think about using the appropriate tool for the situation. You know, in areas where we're capacity building, so we're just trying to build up the science and fisheries management, perhaps some of those really simple data limited approaches are the appropriate tool to use at that point. But I think in many of our regions, we have, you know, a decent amount of knowledge built up expertise and existing management structures that we're, we need to still do data limit assessments along with all of our data rich stuff. So how can we harness our existing model for the data limited framework? Um, so Natalie Dowling and others in 2019 identified three keys to appropriate data limited assessments, um, acknowledge and interpret uncertainty, embed data limited methods and robust harvest strategies, and apply data limited methods in appropriate species specific contexts. So I'm going to try to convince you today that scaling up a more data rich integrated model can allow you to address all three of these key components in a more robust sense. So to date, you know, data limited development has kind of moved along parallel aside data rich assessment to to separate tracks that have not really come together in a meaningful way. Um, we're doing very similar things with different tools. And I'm gonna advocate of how can we bring those together and make a bridge between data limited and data rich so you can move along that spectrum in a stepwise fashion and give yourself answers that you can use in a robust management context. So one big advantage of using an integrative model is that you have to be explicit. Data limited methods often make very hard simplifying assumptions that as a user may not be completely transparent to you or you just have to live with if you want to apply that approach and it may not be appropriate to your situation. So in an integrated age structure model, you have to be explicit about all the dynamics of your stock, your biology, your fishery dynamics. Um, so you've, you can harness pieces of information you have for a stock that maybe we don't have a lot of data to assess, do a robust assessment on this stock, but we have a general understanding of the biology or understanding of a similar biology of a neighboring stock that we think would be appropriate in this context. So we could use those pieces of information and create a more robust assessment, um, trying to integrate these data. And then additionally, because you're using an integrated model approach, 
there's already tools within this model for complex harvest strategies that you're probably already using with your data rich methods that you can then easily incorporate them into your data limited context. So because I work on the west coast of the United States, I think in terms of stock synthesis. So I think stock synthesis is this amazing little Russian nesting doll. <laughs> like big Rick, little Rick, tiny Rick. <laughs> um, that you can make SS as big and as complicated as you want, but you can also make some real simplifying assumptions and get a very simple model using the same platform. So what we've done for data limit assessment on the west coast of the United States is try to think about how we can use SAS, which we use for our data rich docs, and apply that same concept to data limited. So we've developed two different tools, uh, simple stock synthesis, which is a data free method as Andre referred to this morning, where you're just using a catch time series and generating a number of population trajectories, and I'll talk about how we do that. And then you can then step up and incorporate some data through an indices of abundance by doing an extended stock synthesis analysis. Um, and both of these tools are available as our packages on GitHub for people to explore and play with. And it allows you to move up that spectrum of data as you're adding things and hopefully eventually land yourself in the data rich assessment and you have a nice bridge of how you got there. So triple S, how it's cur currently used and you know, I want each of us to think about how these general ideas can be incorporated with whatever integrated platform we're doing for your data rich stocks in your management reasons. But this is how we've done it for the west coast of the US. We wanted to incorporate the uncertainty to three key parameters and set up priors for natural mortality, steepness, and depletion. So because this is SS, we can have sex-specific properties. So you could have sex-specific natural mortality, and then you're able to parameterize productivity in terms of steepness where we might be more familiar of what the reasonable bounds we think steepness is for a stock based upon our data rich assessments, rather than making a data limit assumption of how it parameterized productivity is not completely transparent about what that means in terms of steepness. So then with NSS, you have to be really explicit and you fill out your fixed assumptions on growth, weight at length, fecundity, selectivity. So this is an opportunity for most data limited approaches often assume constant selectivity over time that's asymptotic. Here you can put in different selectivity patterns and run the model in different configurations to explore sensitivities. And basically, so you draw from each of these distributions for the parameters and you solve out for log R0, one parameter, and then you just redo that a thousand times. So it's kind of a Monte Carlo approach sampling from these priors to generate stock trajectories. So here's an example of the prior distributions. And this is based off the case study I'll walk you through quickly today. It's based off of one of our data rich full SS assessments that have been simplified down for, for triple S application. So you have your priors and then your post model priors. So those are just updated by throwing out parameter combinations that made the stock hit zero. So those should typically be pretty consistent with one another. And we can see that here that you're kind of, you're getting in, you're getting out what you put in. You know, so, but because this is SS, you get a time series of abundance. So you have your spawning biomass with an uncertainty interval that's calculated based upon those thousand draws, along with a relative stock status called depletion in this case. And then because also it's SS, you can harness all the power of the forecast file and calculate OFLs or employ your harvest control rule and you can do them on an annual basis. 
the, often with data limited approaches, you get one value. Here's your catch recommendation. And that is what it will be for perpetuity. Here in SS, we can get year specific OFLs that are cohering to our harvest control rule. So then stepping up and adding data, now we are gonna add indices of abundance along with the catch time series. We're still using the same priors, but now because we're using data, we're gonna update our priors into posteriors in a quasi Bayesian context. So how this is being done currently is through adaptive importance sampling. So basically you create a generation of model runs, a thousand runs, and then you use the likelihood values from there and resample those initial runs to try to select parameter combinations that have the best fits to the data. And you know, this is where, when we're thinking about how we can create scalability from data limited to data rich, it's really nice to have you know, Rick at the Northwest Center. So as Jason and I are scratching our heads of how we can do this, that you know, if you're working with the development team, you can talk about you know, this would be really advantageous. You know, something Alan mentioned earlier was the reading and writing of the report file. We're running you know, excess probably 7,000 times for a single run. And the calculation of the log R0, that's maybe a second but the writing of a full report file is in five to 10 seconds. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing it a bunch, it becomes um, computationally intensive. And then plus you have to read and extract quantities from those files. So the shorter, the better. So this is something where we worked with Rick and we created some options that help made this more doable and a quicker turnaround where I think when I started developing this, it was, I'm gonna run it, come back tomorrow, like 24 hours later. We're now, I think we're about seven hours, so it's still time intensive, but it's getting manageable. So with the X excess, we have our priors that go into the model, and then the posteriors, which are shown in blue. So we can see that some of our priors were updated based upon the data, that comparing to the prior that we put in for depletion, and this was depletion in a specific year that we said in the model, it looks like perhaps that prior was poorly misspecified given the data. So it's updated to a slightly different distribution with a higher depletion value. And then comparing the results from triple S, which is basically the data free approach. And now we're incorporating data and that trajectory has been modified based upon those posteriors. And once again, we're getting OFL values that we can compare. And now stepping aside and thinking about, you know, perhaps an approach that some of us have done ourselves is doing a, an age structured surplus production model, which uses index of abundance data, uh, estimates M, steepness and R0, but now we're getting rid of that depletion prior. And so just comparing that outcome with the excess approach and depletion scale, we're getting to approximately the same point. So the depletion prior, that influence is going away and it's the data that are really defining where your uh, stock is ending up at at the end of the time series. So it's kind of a nice check that, okay, the data we are using are, are informative and they're taking the stock away from our priors that we've, we've specified. So now coming to the full Russian nesting doll, uh, we have our full SS model, which is shown in black. And we can see that the top, the spawning biomass from the full SS model is a fair amount above the data limited approaches, but we can understand why that model has changed from our simple application because we've used the same framework across that spectrum that we can really drill down to, okay, what causes that? Once you add in recruitment deviations, all the composition data, why is that different? Is it not just a different assumption about productivity or how growth occurs? It's, it's these tractable components of the model. So in this context, 
by profiling over the full model for R0, we know that recruitment deviations are highly informative of what the model wants R0 to be. And in our data limited context, you're not doing recruitment deviation, so no surprise that you're getting a slightly different answer there. But in the relative scale, you're getting approximately the same trend in the population, ending up in a similar spot. And the uncertainty from the data limit approaches well encapsulate the full model. So we might not get the scale exactly right, but we're getting the uncertainty and the relative stock status um, to match a bit more. So that's what we've done so far. Uh, we're constantly thinking of ways to how can we do what we're doing better um, and getting away from these R packages that wrap around SS. You know, can we use MCMC with NSS to give us robust answers? And so far, yes and no. Um, I think not surprisingly, when you go to MCMC, you get rid of the depletion prior. Um, you're getting reasonable distributions for natural mortality and steepness, but log R0 is perhaps poorly defined on the upper end. And that's not terribly surprising. It's a little weird behavior, but perhaps in the mode, the mode from these distributions are approximately what the full model would give you. So how can we do this a little better using MCMC? Um, another shout out to Cole Monahan. He's done a lot of work on how do we make the MCMC sampler more effective and faster with this no U-term sampler. So we're going to look at, you know, is there a way we can use this approach to get reasonable MCMC results in a faster time frame with NSS? And then the other area that we're currently working on that right now our, our data limit approaches are you have catch and you have index data. But what if you have a couple years of composition data? How do we incorporate that into our data limited framework? And that would allow you possibly to get away from that depletion prior and actually base that depletion estimate on data rather than a prior. And so we're starting a project this fall with Merrill Rudd, who's gonna look at um, doing some of this with NSS. Um, and comparing to her model structure line, which is created for data limit assessments, and see how each of those approaches perform. So in summary, you know, here's a schematic of all the different paths that you can take within the single model platform. That depending on what kind of data type, you can choose your own adventure and end up with a very different model but each of these models are comparable across the spectrum. So when you get more data, you can easily jump into the next platform. And so, you know, the, you know the, what I'm really trying to convey is that doing it all in one platform that's scalable up and down allows you perhaps to better understand your results um, rather than getting an orange and an apple and looking at them, I don't know why they're different. I don't know what the assumptions that went into the model are. And why do I have an orange and apple? Are, not, are they the same thing? Here, we can really dive in and think about those questions in a more meaningful context. Um, you get to inherit the structure for the parameterizations of your more data-rich assessments. So you can make sure your assumptions are consistent. Um, and it also facilitates the application of harvest strategies that you already might be using in a robust sense that's easy for users and stakeholders to understand. Um, but I think the most important thing, it really confronts the user to think about all the hidden model assumptions because in SS or any complicated integrated framework, you have to specify all those things that we often try to sweep under the rug in data limit assessments. You're specifying growth. What kind of recruitment, uh, stock recruitment relation am I gonna assume? What is the selectivity for that stock going to look like? So you really have to be explicit and you can explore sensitivities to all these different assumptions. And I think with that, I'll open to questions and then we can go to lunch.
Okay, we have quite a bit of time for questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, I liked your talk. Um, do you have any examples or have you thought about um, situations where you might have length compositions and index but not catch? And sometimes it could be easier to get photos of fish but not to actually sample all of the catch. Yeah, that, that is a question of, like maybe you know some catch but you don't have a whole time series. Uh, how do you deal with that? And so we haven't done a lot with that yet because that's not a huge issue on our West Coast. But um, I think that's part of the exploration that Meryl will be, will be doing this fall and because Lyme doesn't require a full catch time series. And so doing those comparisons is how can we perhaps modify SS using historical equilibrium catch or some kind of assumptions to get your model to run, but we haven't, we don't have an answer yet, but we're actively working on it. Oh, do you Rick, have a comment, question? It's easy, I've done that. There uh, you go. Yeah, I mean, you could set up a one year time series. You could mm -hmm. just, and all the action is just in uh, setting up that initial, uh, initial year. So you essentially can estimate the initial F mm -hmm. as a, a one year thing, and then the data for that following year. And uh, that would allow you to fit just to one composition observation and get the implied Z or NF uh, for that one mm -hmm. composition observation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we should sort of step back and, and uh, firstly, I like the approach, obviously, um, but I think we need to look at it in the mm -hmm. context of what it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you talk about triple S, I think of it as a prior, because that's all it is. All you've done is you've taken a set of parameters and hopefully you haven't lost them. You should like that steepness when it vanished. Um, and all you're really doing is transforming what, from one set of parameters into another set of parameters. So your posterior for OFL is just a function of your input. So you, mm -hmm. and we need to call it what it is. It's not an analysis, it's just rewriting the prior. Yep. Um, and then as you add your data, you update it. Um, but the one thing that you can do in even at triple S level is have rec devs and in mm -hmm. fact for some of the whale assessments we've got we go back even further than you guys do we go back to 1600 for some of our assessments and there we know ranges of catches and so when mm. you're generating you put a prior on your catches the method works perfectly well I wouldn't try and do uh, adaptive sampling from that but you can in principle. Uh, the other thing I was a little concerned about, and I think I've been concerned about before, is moving to the R0 prior, mm -hmm. because that's just bad. Yeah. Um, we really shouldn't be using the R0 prior, because essentially you update the prior without any data, and that really violates all the principles of statistical analysis. You, you only can learn about the priors from the data. So I, I would have used that depletion prior throughout. Okay. Because at least it expresses your uncertainty about the thing you care about. So then you don't have to worry about the fact that R0 is unbounded because it's not unbounded. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was yeah. wondering if you could give us perspective on um, what you think about uh, production models and their role in this because um, obviously it's different to that framework and I wonder whether you, you'll be an advocate for throwing them away or whether you think they have value. Well, I, I think they absolutely have value, but um, I, I think the challenge is, is moving between platforms. So you have a production model, then you step to the age structure production model. And if those items are consistent in their assumptions, then you get comparable results. But when they're not, and then you get different answers, you know, what do we do there? But I think, you know, SS, it's a production model, but it's age structured. So it's pretty similar to a production model that you can collapse it down if you want, but I think you get the advantage of having an age structure model. Yeah. Yeah, down the back, yeah. Hey, hey Chantel. Um, so I, I also appreciate this approach of kind of providing the bridging, but I'm curious if you could talk about, in your experience, implementing this if there's any trade-offs when we provide people that maybe are still, or you know, fisheries that are still in the process of capacity building, um, if you kind of provide them with more tools than they're ready to understand mm -hmm. yet, 
and yeah, kind of what the risks might be versus just giving them a, a perfect Russian doll. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important point that um, this is a doable tool for areas where you've built up the capacity and the knowledge and expertise, but in areas where they're just struggling of what do I even do? Do I have any data? And trying to build up the scientific capacity, it's probably best to start with a much simpler data limited suite of tools and just really talk about all right, you're doing this length-based SPR, and here are all the assumptions you're inheriting with that method. Are you comfortable with that? And trying to build up that knowledge first, and then, you know, once that has built up a bit more, then try to move this way, but it's a, it's a tough challenge. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, well, I have a little problem with this, especially the catch-based models, mm -hmm. because in, and putting them on a, on a single framework um, have this effect that people consider them to be an assessment. And I know yeah. they are yeah. not, yeah. but totally. that's the yeah. risk. I get and, that. And what, what, uh, what, um, what has happened, at least in Europe, and I'm wondering if that is happening already also in other places, is that you, when your uh, statistical catch at age fails, you degrade the model, you degrade the stock and say, oh, no, this is not a, a tier one stock anymore. It becomes a tier three, a category three stock. And you start giving advice uh, about this stock based on these data poor mm -hmm. methods. The way uh, a manager or a policy maker takes that information is for the same value. You give them mm -hmm. something and say, well, we are giving you advice on this based on these uh, results. Most people won't understand these differences and they take it for granted. Yeah. And what, what's happening is, is a bit of a data trap, a data poor trap. You get the stock in that situation, you're giving information about them, you're giving advice based on those things, and then people take it. And that stock, mm -hmm. which you'd expect a situation like this would be uh, an optimal situation to, to have your stock moving up the ladder, mm -hmm. it doesn't because it gets trapped at that level yeah. of data poor. So this is not really a question for you, not for your presentation. It's more like a comment about things that are happening by the fact that we are putting these things together as if they are the same. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, that they're not the same. And we should not convey that they are and be really clear about, your, like what Andre said, you're getting out what you put in. So you're not, you're data free. Um, and we should take those estimates with caution. And how we've built that onto Arcos is that depending on how you structure your model, what kind of data you use, you get what we term buffered. Um, you apply different precautionary metrics based upon where you are in that tier system. So, you know, triple S would be tier three and you get a significant cut to whatever the catch recommendation is to account for the uncertainty. But we also need to think about how do we move stocks from the data-free approaches somewhere else. And so how do you do that? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a really good point, Ernesto. Um, any other questions? Okay. So I've, I've got a comment. I actually mm -hmm. really like this approach. I'm not a fan of data poor methods either, partly because they pretty much hide all the, uh, the assumptions you're making. And um, they also, um, ignore a lot of the data that may be available and knowledge that is available. Mm -hmm. And if you put it into an integrated context like this, you can, you know, make things explicit and take advantage of everything. Um, the only way that you may consider a data poor method good is that you've done MSE to simulate it, to make sure that it worked in the context of the harvest control rule and everything. The problem with that is you need an operating model. So to create the operating model, you need to go through this here. So if you're going through this, why don't you create a better data poor method based on the integrated model and then have an operating model that is, I don't know, has a lot of uncertainty. Um, the other thing is that the data poor methods may not present the uncertainty. Whereas yeah. here, if you have a control rule that's based on the uncertainty, mm -hmm. you estimate the uncertainty in here, and then that gives the incentive for, um, people to collect more data to reduce the uncertainty so the catches can increase because your knowledge is better and you don't have to be as precautionary. Yeah, and we're, 
we're currently having that kind of conversation in our management council on our coast because we have stocks that are experiencing high cuts to the OFL based upon the uncertainty and the lack of data. So we, it gives the incentive for people and stakeholders to go out and get the data and figure out how to move them up that framework. But yeah, that's kind of a potluck that you kind of throw in what you want and leave out what you don't have and it's a flexible tool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so thanks a lot. So we are, we're breaking for lunch. We are back at 1.30.
said that, you know, I think yesterday was my shortest presentation. Oh, sure. You're right. I lost it. Hi there. 